Welcome to the Paradigm Podcast, where we explore revolutionary ideas with the world's most brilliant minds. I'm your host, Matt Galletta. Today, I'll be speaking with Michael Levin about bioengineering and unconventional forms of life in mind. Michael is a pioneer in the field of synthetic biology. He's a distinguished professor at Tufts University with a background both in computer science and biology, including a PhD from Harvard and postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. Michael's research is pushing the frontiers of what we know about bioengineering and synthetic life, addressing deep and important questions, such as how cognition emerges in biological systems and how we can engineer new biological systems to achieve specific goals, like regenerating organs or combating the growth of cancerous tumors. Today, Michael and I discuss a wide range of topics, including the emergence of mind from matter, unconventional forms of cognition, consciousness, free will, and Michael's recent work on sentience beyond traditional biological systems. This was a wonderful conversation, and I'm so excited to share it with you. So let's get to it. Here is my conversation with Michael Levin. I'm here with Michael Levin. Michael, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Great to be here. Good to see you again. Before getting to introductions, I would like to set the scene a bit by asking what's perhaps a little bit of an odd question, but I think it'll set us up well for the conversation that's to come. That question is, what happens to a human embryo when it's cut in half? Uh, well, uh, a number of embryos, uh, a number of types of embryos have something called regulative development, which means that if functionally speaking, each side can tell that uh, something is missing and they regenerate whatever is not there. So you become monozygotic twins, quadruplets, triplets, uh, whatever. Yeah. So this is this is this is how twins and 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 multiple births are made, at least for uh, monozygotic ones. Uh, some creatures like the armadillo do this all the time. So there's species that are that do quadruplets every single birth, and that's and that's what happens. That each side just rebuilds whatever is missing. It's really interesting because famously, if one cuts an adult starfish in half, the starfish doesn't die. It grows into two whole new starfish. And so the question is, if that happens with adult starfish and it happens with human embryos, why does it not happen with human adults? Uh, well, it's, that's a good question. Uh, it happens with some kind of adults. So with planarian flatworms, for example, um, yeah, you can take an adult and cut it into pieces. And the record is, I think, 276 pieces or something like that. And every piece will give rise to another full adult. So some animals are able to do it. Um, why humans are not able to do it, uh, there are no, nobody knows for sure, but there are boring possibilities and more interesting possibilities. The boring possibility is that it's uh, simply too hard and, and that you wouldn't survive, right? So, so, so when you cut a, an adult human in half, uh, that, that initial trauma and all the stuff that's going to happen next basically precludes any possibility that you're going to survive, right? You're going to lose all the body fluids and all that. So that, that's, that's kind of the boring, boring uh, for practicalities. Uh, there, there may be more interesting reasons why uh, evolution did not make humans more regenerative. And we can, you know, I can tell you some stories that are maybe plausible, but, but no, nobody actually knows for sure. That's quite curious because the human body does heal itself from some injuries, you know, minor injuries like cuts and bruises are almost bound to heal. And then we do get larger species like salamanders who can do fairly interesting things, for example, grow back a tail. And so the question is, why does it stop with cuts and bruises? Why can't humans grow back whole limbs, for example, organs? You know, why, why are we so sort of defective compared to these other animals? Well, uh, again, a couple of possibilities. I mean, one, one plausible story is that if you think about our ancestors, so some sort of mouse-like uh, creature, early mammal running around the forest and uh, somebody bites your leg off, uh, evolutionarily, it may well be that the chances of being able to regenerate anything, given that A, you might bleed out, you might get infected, you're going to be grinding that um, appendage into the wood, into the forest floor as you're walking around, so damaging whatever's trying to regenerate. It might be that uh, under those conditions, you're better off just scarring and hoping that you don't bleed out and get infected. Um, interesting to note that the one uh, example of really good mammalian regeneration, which is deer antlers, it is in a non-load-bearing appendage. There you have something you never actually step on, uh, right? And so it's sort of on top of on top of the head. And um, so that's so that's kind of one possibility. Another another interesting aspect is that most 
uh, regenerators, not all, but most good regenerators are aquatic. And it may also be that in dry air, it's just very hard to drive all the bioelectric currents that are a, nasty, uh, um, a required part of uh, initiation of regeneration, which is why, you know, in, in our efforts, and so this is uh, David Kaplan's group and, and myself, we're working on limb regeneration. And part of that intervention is a wearable bioreactor that provides an aqueous protective environment to the wound such that it's almost amniotic. It's it's trying to convince the cells that it's A, that it's safe to, it's it's worthwhile to invest energy in regenerating and B, it is an aqueous environment in which we can support all those bioelectric events that are needed. As you were speaking there, it seemed to be clear that there are almost two distinct angles or related angles from which to approach this problem. Uh, the first is the level of the genetic code itself. Does the code uh, facilitate the growth of limbs and that sort of healing, for example? Um, and the other is the environment. Does the environment afford the code to be able to execute on those operations? Is that a, an accurate way of categorizing or breaking down this problem in your view? Yeah, I, th I think that's true. And I think another way to carve it up also into two pieces is uh, A, giving the cells the information they need to push them towards this incredible construction project. So so all of this, all of this, of course, is to happened once during embryonic development. They built all the organs. So that information hasn't gone anywhere. The cells, the cells still can do it. But but giving them the stimuli, the um the correct, uh, the correct signals to get them to, to get the collective of cells uh embarked on this on this morphogenetic uh, uh journey through through anatomical space is uh is is one thing and then the other thing is the delivery vector so how do you get that information to them right is it uh and and so in our case it's a bunch of ion channel drugs designed to put the cells in a particular electrical state and this wearable um contraption that uh, that uh, provides the environment in which we support that that growth process yeah well, look, you've mentioned several highly interesting ideas already, and I'm looking forward to digging into some of them with you shortly. But I think it's probably a good time to introduce you to our listeners. From my perspective, it's really obvious why uh, we would be speaking today. The Paradigm Podcast is about talking to the people who are really at the forefront of science and philosophy, pushing the frontiers of what we know. And your work absolutely does that in so many different ways uh, in the topics of bioengineering in looking at synthetic and alternative forms of of life um, and so for me it's it's really natural to, to have you on um, but why don't you share with our listeners a brief bit about uh, your background and what it is you're focusing on at the moment sure uh well let's see um uh, my bio i got a, a degree an undergraduate degree in computer science and then and then another one in biology um, I went for grad school, uh, got a PhD in genetics at Harvard Medical School, uh, did a postdoc in cell biology after that, and then uh, started my own lab uh, in 2000 um, at the Forsyth Institute, which was uh, part of uh, Harvard uh, the Dental School at that time. And then, uh, then around 2009, I moved the group to Tufts University. That's where I work now. So I'm a professor in the biology department at Tufts. I'm also a um, an, uh, an associate uh, faculty member at the Wies Institute at Harvard. We are a group of roughly 30 people in the lab. We're a mix of um, computational folks, uh, bi um, biologists, bioengineers, um, some computer scientists, and so on. And uh, we work on a wide range of uh, different aspects of the same problem. So we do we do uh, cancer biology, we do birth defects, uh, regeneration. Um, uh, cognition, behavioral science, a little bit of AI, uh, uh, all all kinds of the all kinds of things, and and all of them are, all, all of these in my mind are pieces of one puzzle, which is to understand diverse intelligence, to understand embodied minds. How how do unconventional uh, uh, minds of different kinds of cognition exist in the physical world? Where do they come from? Where do their goals come from? How do they scale up? How do we relate to uh, these unconventional intelligences? Everything we do is 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 around that question but it generates all kinds of practical implications so uh we generate um things that are on their way towards biomedicine so treatments for birth defects for uh, traumatic injuries for cancer and so on before this conversation you sent me an interesting paper of yours that touches on many of those topics and i would love to dig into that in a second because it's a truly remarkable paper uh, but before we do you know you mentioned this transition from computer science to biology and I would actually love to dig into that a bit because I think these things are seen as distinct or very, you know, very different topics in many people's minds. 
but you seem to think of them in a much more unified manner. Is that a direct, a correct categorization? And, um, you know, what can you say about that? Yeah. Um, and you're right. I, I do see these things as extremely unified when, if I, if I had to boil down, sometimes people ask me for a, for a short description of what I am and, uh, it's hard, but, but if I really had to boil it down, I, I, I think I'm a computer scientist working in all kinds of unconventional media, including wet biologicals. So, um, the reason, the reason uh, that uh, to me these are these are part of the same problem is uh, if you th if the way the way I think about this um, and it goes all the way back to when I was a, when I was a kid and I had kind of two two main loves which were um, electronics and other kinds of engineering and also playing with insects and bugs outside and I spent all kinds of time trying to figure out ways in which these things were different and yet and ways in which they were the same and ways in which their behavior was a function of their structure and their history and and all of that. And uh, if you th if you think about it, uh, there there are two magical classes in an ecology curriculum, and one of those is developmental biology, and one of those is engineering one electrical engineering one hundred and one. And the diff the the reason they're both magic, and it's for the same reason. Uh, in developmental biology, you you start with a little blob of physics and chemistry. You start with an unfertilized oocyte, and in front of your eyes, let's say you're dealing with a with a frog embryo or something like that. Um, in front of your eyes, you 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 watch this this slow, gradual process of going from physics to mind because you start with a with, with a with a little little blob that's well described by chemistry and physics, and people would look at that conventionally and say, "Well, that's that's it. This is a machine. There's nothing um, uh, there's nothing cognitive there. It's just it's so called just physics." I actually hate that phrase, but people use it all the time. It's just physics, and then and then slowly and and gradually it self assembles into something with a mind, maybe a simple mind, maybe a very complex mind, maybe a human that will then go on to make all kinds of statements about you know, how, how, you know, how humans are, uh, have true cognition, and they're not mere, you know, mechanisms and all that. But, but where did you come from? You came from a single cell. And so that that process in front of your eyes of going from 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 matter to, to, to mind is maybe one of the most, if not the most profound things that there is in science. And in electrical engineering, you see exactly the same thing. So you start off, with with a very mechanical things like uh, Ohm's law and, and voltages and currents and things like this. And then with your own two hands, you go on and you build logic gates, right? You build some transistors and then you build some logic gates and logic gates give you a truth table. And so now you're doing logic. You're doing the basics of rational thought. And so you got to this ability to do rational uh, the kind of what 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 makes us uh, you know what makes mind unique is this this among many other things the the, the ability to uh, to have these abstract thoughts perhaps encoded by logic and you got there from from the physics of Ohm's law step by step right and and so and so together both of those things they tread the same journey and I actually think I, I'm I'm certainly not the first person to, to 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 think stuff like this isn't it interesting that Alan Turing although I, I don't think he wrote directly on this but uh, he was very interested in, in of course, minds and computation and, uh, and and thinking and machines and all that. But he also wrote a paper on morphogenesis. He wrote a paper on um, a biological order arising, you know, on chemical morphogenesis, on biological order order arising from a well mixed uh, uh, chemical chemical soup. And so I think I think he saw this profound uh, invariant that that the 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 intelligence that we see during the organization of the body is fundamentally the same problem as the appearance of intelligence out of matter i think you saw that quite clearly and, and and other people have as well over the years it feels like you're very much scratching at that sort of mind body duality issue that's uh, really common you know the two branches of thought that are commonly seen as distinct on the one hand problems of cognition of what the mind does um, and on the other hand you know, issues of, of the body, of morphogenesis, of form. And um, I think many people still to this day do see those as uh, very much distinct fields to be studied separately. You know, the former potentially in a computer science context, uh, the latter in a biological context. Um, but it really feels that your view is, again, more unified, seeing um, both, both, you know, form and uh, cognition potentially as part of the same picture is is that uh, am i am i reading that right yeah in, in fact i think i think it's even more it's, it's even more unified than that um i'm i'm looking for a uh the fundamental invariant of cognition and 
that can take place in lots of different problem spaces. So, so when that takes place in the in our familiar three dimensional world, um, in particular by medium sized objects moving at medium speeds, we routinely recognize that as intelligent behavior. So we will see a monkey or a, or a dog or an octopus or, or something, you know, do, doing something in the three dimensional world, and and we're very good at recognizing how how intelligent, you know, what, what kind of cognitive capacities are are there. But there are other problem spaces that we're just not used to, but but are are equally rife with intelligent problem solving. So anatomical morphous space. So the ability of a collective intelligence of cells to build particular uh, uh, structures, basically navigate that space, reach reach from from a position of us being a single egg cell to the uh, the location in that anatomical space that corresponds to an adult a complex morphology. And by the way, and crucially, being able to navigate despite disturbances. So as you started out by, by being cut in half or being deviated in some way, they still get to where they're going. So this is uh, a, a view of intelligence that's sort of similar to what William James said when he said, um, intelligence is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And so that that kind of process and, and different sort of degrees of competency of that process can occur in lots of different spaces. So three-dimensional space of behavior, anatomical morphous space, uh, transcriptional space, the space of all possible gene expressions, right? So we've studied gene regulatory networks that can do learning and, and do all kinds of interesting things in transcriptional space, um, physiological space, metabolic space, all of these different kinds of uh, competencies and computations are the workings out of different kinds of intelligence that may be hard for us to uh, recognize, but that just means we have to work harder. You know, whenever whenever um, uh, we estimate the IQ level of some particular system, we're really taking an intelligence test ourselves. What we're really saying is, this is what I'm smart enough to recognize this creature as, or or the system as doing. And we have to be very humble about those things because we're not very good at it outside of a narrow set of competencies. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it, it's probably worthwhile pausing to define intelligence and um, and cognition and distinguish them if they are different. Um, and in particular, I would love to hear your views on that William James quote. Why why might that be a good definition of intelligence? Uh, and you know what what does it give us that other definitions potentially don't? So so my view on all of this terminology is that uh, terms are only as good as uh, the enabling uh, for the facilitating progress that they give you in some particular context. So, uh, you know, if if you're in if you're in um, neurobiology 101, we don't want to argue about what a neuron is. Everybody knows what a neuron is. We're going to look at them. We're going to study them. Okay, everybody knows. And you know, uh, if you're going to court, everybody knows what an adult is. It's it's uh, you know, you've reached your 18th birthday. Boom, you're an adult. Okay, done. But but in other contexts, asking what a neuron actually is in an evolutionary cell biology context, given that most of the cells in the body do some of the, the same things with the same materials, uh, it becomes very interesting, right? So, so all of this terminology has particular uses where there's no point in getting, getting um, weird and expanded about it. And then there are other contexts where it really pays to, to look at these things in a broader way and, and, and try, to, um, try, to, try to see what, what happens at the edges of these definitions. So, um, so in, within the context that we're talking about here, for me, intelligence is uh, some degree of competency in solving problems. And what that means is if you as an observer stipulate some particular problem space that the system is working in, you stipulate some particular goal that you think it's trying to reach, and you make a, a hypothesis, and so this is a testable empirical claim about how much a competency it has to reach that goal despite all the various things that could happen and then and then and then that's testable and then we test it and we you know we see we see whose hypothesis is better just, you know normal normal science cognition uh, i tend to use the word cognition uh, for the sum total of all of the different uh computational tricks that one can use to implement various degrees of intelligent behavior so this might be memory it might be decision making in advanced creatures it might be language and pre-planning and all kinds of other things in simple systems it might be uh things that look to us like habituation or sensitization or associative learning that whole that whole uh, sort of sort of spectrum so so the other thing you asked which was which was really crucial is what does this all give you what's the what's the point of of uh, of this continuum view. So I, I always tend to argue for a 
uh, a kind of uh, continuum hypothesis where I do see all of these things as part of the same spectrum. And in particular, someone, and I wish I wish I could remember who said this to give them credit, somebody named it, uh, uh, referred to it as the spectrum of competencies between, on the one end, two magnets trying to get together, and on the other end, Romeo and Juliet trying to get together. And you see, right, you 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 feel this spectrum immediately where the magnets, all they know how to do is minimize that, that distance. And if there's a barrier between them, they're just going to sit there pressed up against the barrier, and that's all they're ever going to do. But uh, Romeo and Juliet will evince all kinds of uh, clever uh, ways to uh, to get their goals met. And in between, you'll have Breitenberg vehicles and you'll have autonomous the, the robotics of various kinds and insects and, and, and everything else, you know, everything's somewhere on this continuum. So um, what, so what does it give what, what, what does it give you? Um, well, on a, on a global scale, uh, kind of on a global perspective, one thing that we're supposed to be doing in science is to infer, uh, com a compression. We're supposed to go from from lots of individual observations to some underlying simpler reality that that lets us see different things in the from the same kind of uh, framework. So so you know what 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 Newton did, which was which was so cool, is among many other things, is um, he was able to see the the motion of the apple on Earth and the motion of the moon around the planet as parts of the working out of the same set of laws. So this is the kind of unif unification we're supposed to be going after. That's that's kind of the global perspective. Um, the uh, you know, and 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 I think this is important because people people uh, have said to me, for example, um, you know, some of the things that you study don't call it memory because it makes you know people who study memory in the brain upset. Call it call it something else. Come up with a different word, and then you don't have to have all these arguments. You know, call it memory, and then and then 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 you're good. And I, you know. It, it's I, I think it that, that that misses a great opportunity because if 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 Isaac Newton had gravity and schmavity for for the different uh, of you know phenomena that he was studying, he would have missed out on the most important thing, right? So so we're supposed to be looking for these invariances. More specifically, what it allows you to do in terms of research, and I think it's really critical that all this stuff isn't just philosophy. It's supposed to help um, uh, develop new new research programs and new capabilities. Is it allows you to port. Uh, tools and concepts from one field into another. So um, uh, just to give a very simple example, if if you look at a gene regulatory network and you are convinced uh, for, by a priori sort of philosophical stance that this thing is, I mean, you can see it's mechanical, it's got no, no, um, uh, 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 it's, it's deterministic, it's mechanical, you can see all the pieces, there's no magic to it. And so if you're convinced uh, a priori that this thing has zero cognition, then what you would never do was something that we did recently, which is to apply some techniques from uh, very simple behavioral science, which is training, so so associative conditioning, and you find out that guess what? Uh, most most biological uh, pathways in gene regulatory network models can actually learn. They have six different kinds of memory. They can learn using associative conditioning and, and various other cool um, capabilities. So so just in general, what it and we've been doing this for years is showing how you can basically take concepts from computational neuroscience, from psychology, from psychiatry, from uh, from, from physics, from, from computer science, and deploy them in a completely diff different area. And that the, the reason that all of these techniques cannot distinguish whether you're working in brains or working in uh, in morphogenesis is the, the tools can't tell the difference, the, the, the concepts work, uh, map across very nicely because this is a continuum. And so I think that's what a continuum view does for you. It liberates you and, and shows you that you can, you can, you can port um, approaches from other fields that might be very useful. Yeah, this portability concept actually reminds me of something that's well known in other areas of science, in particular in sort of the fundamental sciences, uh, physics being the prime example here, of reductionism, uh, which is basically the idea that any special science or any higher level description of something could in principle be broken down into smaller underlying components or more fundamental underlying components and in the scientific context with the physics contents there's this belief that i think most physicists would hold uh, that all of the emergent special sciences like chemistry and biology um, are really just expressions of some underlying fundamental laws, whether those laws be the quantum mechanical laws or laws of particle physics, whatever it is, um, that it's really just a matter of choosing the right level of abstraction with which to describe the system. And 
my read for medicine and the regenerative medicine you're talking about is is similar where um you know in, in principle i think the belief is that all of medicine should be doable from some sort of underlying fundamental laws but computationally that's just intractable it's too difficult and so picking a higher level of abstraction where some of the the nuance the difficulties are abstracted away and kind of letting the, the system do a bit of work for you feels like then it could be potentially a fruitful endeavor and so what, what you're saying is it your view that choosing the wrong level of abstraction in medicine and in regenerative medicine is, is that something that has blocked the the progress of this field um well well yeah i i think you you're absolutely right that that choosing and stating outright uh, a particular level of abstraction and the reason that you've you've taken that level is 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 important and and i do think it's 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 greatly limiting for many fields including regenerative medicine uh Currently, if 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 you look at where all the excitement is in in um, let's say molecular medicine, it's all at the level of the hardware. So so genome editing, a pathway remodel, rewiring, a protein engineering, single cell approaches, single molecule approaches. It's all at the level of hardware. And my analogy when I talk about this to my students is that uh, the wh why don't you when 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 you're on your laptop and you want to go from Photoshop to Microsoft Word, why don't you get out your soldering iron and start and start the soldering away at your at your computer, right? Because because what what computer science has figured out uh, since since you know in the '40s that's what you did in order to reprogram a computer you have to physically plug wires in and out so you had to be at the level of the hardware. But what basically they were able to realize is that uh, for certain kinds of architectures it's much more powerful to reprogram the machine with stimuli, with experiences, with a, by using a particular interface, by taking advantage of its computational intelligence, by, by, uh, using, uh, by exploiting its causal structure to use the interface that it offers you, which is, which is this reprogrammable interface. And, uh, and my claim is that uh, biology is way ahead of us in having reprogrammable uh, intelligent components. And I think we're leaving so much on the table in medicine today by treating all of this as a clockwork. I think we're way off in terms of, you know, so 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 in my in my framework, there's a continuum. I call it a continuum of persuadability, which we can talk about, that um goes all the way from sort of mechanical rewiring, which you can do with things like like mechanical clocks and so on, through uh to reprogramming, things like thermostats and training, things like certain animals, and then rational arguments for for humans and so on. And and with any given system, you want to be at the right level. If you're at the wrong level, and you can make mistakes in both directions, you can treat people as if they were a simple automata, which will, doesn't work out well, or you can you can try to argue with a mechanical clock. Neither neither works. You have to pick the you have to pick the optimal level. And I think in 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 biology and medicine, we have uh, ba basically due to um, this idea that you should always. I think I think it's a it's a it's a profoundly mistaken idea. This kind of teleophobia where people uh people assume that that the best explanation is the most mechanical one uh everything tries to tries to uh, uh reduce down to chemistry and i think we leave we leave a lot of powerful uh, things and, and this is this is uh this, this is now be, being realized by all 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 of the work on um uh, pl placebo effects and mind body medicine we're now realizing that that uh the, the with the binding of your of your drug to your molecular target is only part of the story and the bigger context you know your expectations your social uh, uh network your your attitude towards your therapist is actually a huge component of what actually happens physiologically so so we're, we're sort of you know so th those kind of folks are starting to come at it from from that end and, and we of course from ours yeah i would love to get your thoughts on what has driven this sort of predisposition to choose the wrong level of abstraction in the biological and medical fields because when i reflect on it in many other fields we're actually very good at choosing the right level of abstraction uh, for, for example in everyday life you know humans walking around in the world interacting with one another we're perfectly fine operating on the level of emotions and reading someone's facial expression and inferring how they're feeling and not having to look into sort of underlying mechanistic behavior of what's going on in their brains um, and you know, for running a company, for example, nobody thinks that you have to understand the individual psychologies and decision theory of every single person in the organization. Um, we're completely fine to, to treat 
company running as sort of autonomous teams and units that do their own thing. And, um, you know, that that's really fruitful. That's a much more effective way to operate in those contexts. And in other sciences, I think uh, we have a similar situation. But when I reflect at what I know about the medical field and how that's progressing, it seems very different. I mean, the, the, the example that comes to mind here is my fiance works in the pharmaceutical field. And all that they talk about these days is um, sort of precision medicine, highly, highly detailed mechanistic uh, um, descriptions of, of things in pharmaceutical context. And it, it feels that it's a very different level of abstraction to what you're talking about, which is, you know, instead of focusing on the smaller scale and on the micro, why not let some of the biology do the work for you? Um, yeah, my, my reading of, of the history of science suggests that it's it's two things. One is uh, a kind of uh, physics envy in the sense of um, uh, the drive towards simplicity and precision. So so biology is is unbelievably messy. Uh, there's there, it's it's hugely variable. There's noise. There's uh, you know high dimensional data, all that. And I think I think generally everybody just kind of hopes that if if we could only be like physics, where things are precise and things are simple, and we can get down to to specific laws that actually predict things. You know, those are very hard to come by in biology, right? The real real theories that actually predict anything, and. Uh, that's that's part of it. I think I think the bigger part of it had to do with the history, at least in the West, of uh, resistance to religion, because in the olden days, there was really only two ways to be to be. You could be dumb like rocks, or you could be smart like humans and angels. And so, as science was getting going, what nobody wanted to do was in in in, in science anyway. In the in the, the you know kind of the, at the beginning of of, of this of this uh, enlightenment. It was it was pretty clear that which what what was not going to lead to progress is to uh, to imagine uh, uh, human or higher level intelligence in every rock in every chemical reaction like like we needed to get away from that because because the the baggage of of religion was 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 just too much right so so everything kind of went in the other direction and everybody said look the way the 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 far bigger mistake that you could make is to uh, kind of uh, and and then they coined this this word this anthropomorphizing, which I, I think is also a terrible word. But but this 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 idea of 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 ascribing human level properties to these other things, and and that worked really well for a lot of low hanging fruit, right? For a lot of stuff in physics and chemistry and in, in, in engineering, it that that was that was great. Um, but now a lot, is, especially in biology and biomedicine, all that low hanging fruit has been picked. We are now to the point where we I, I think we really need to uh, exploit the lessons of uh, cybernetics and behavior of science, which tells us that it doesn't have to be dumb like rocks or smart like humans. There are many, many different gradations in between. And people like Wiener and, and uh, Norbert Wiener and his colleagues who have developed them, um, you know, these these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, ladders or or, or a continua of of uh, teleology, we'll go all the way from passive matter to active matter to feedback to to you know all the all the cybernetic stuff. We now understand that there are different degrees of competency. And it isn't it it isn't magic and it isn't scary and we can now think about uh, you know it used to be that humans had goals machines couldn't have goals well your thermostat has goals your thermostat has little tiny goals and and if you don't believe that you you know if you're gonna if you're gonna hire somebody to work on your uh, HVAC system don't hire somebody that doesn't believe in machines with goals because they're gonna be useless and so so and and it's even and it's way worse with with biology and medicine if if in 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 the future. Um, uh, I think that we have much more utility to uh, to, 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 to squeeze out of uh, approaches that really take advantage of the inherent intelligence of the cells, not just the complexity, not just the noise management, actually, but literally the intelligence of, of cells and tissues. Yeah, one thing we should probably be a bit careful with here is the definition of intelligence and how that differs from the concept of consciousness. Because I think in many people's minds, these concepts overlap and uh, potentially get confused. And I would actually think a lot of people would assume that you can't have intelligence without consciousness or vice versa. Um, and in your view, it seems that these are actually, these are not the same thing. And so let's, let's disambiguate these, these two terms here. Uh, what, what, are, what are your views on consciousness? Do you think that a consciousness can exist without intelligence? And do you think intelligence can exist without consciousness? 
Um, okay, so so the most important thing I, I I can say about consciousness is that the vast majority of the things that we've talked about so far do not require us to think about consciousness at all. So goals do not require consciousness. Intelligence does not by itself require consciousness. All of the things I'm talking about are perfectly uh, objectively of, um, uh, accessible third person types of science. So things that you you see and test in the outside world. Uh, consciousness as a first person aspect to it as experience is an interesting question. I don't believe it's a non-issue like some people do. I do. I do think it's an interesting question. However, it's a completely separate question from anything that we've been talking about. So I think that's absolutely essential. People, uh, people will often say, "Oh my God!" So you, so you're saying rocks are conscious? That, that's that's a, what, what is and in, in, in and I don't I don't even like this this um, <clears throat> kind of a dichotomy of is and isn't. But I, I've said very little about consciousness in 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 you know in in my various papers. I a, a little bit. We can we can talk about it if you want. But but the vast majority of this has nothing to do with consciousness. It is it is all about the third. It is all about straight up third person science, the regular normal science that does not require you to deal with the uh, the hard problem of consciousness in any way. Yes. Well, I'm happy to park the question of consciousness for now. However, I would like to pick it up at the end of this conversation when we we get to the paper that you sent, because in the final section of that paper, you mention a very interesting concept about a new ethical framework based on uh, a cognitive light cone, I think you call it, so cognitive ability. And I personally think that this uh, touches these topics of consciousness. But uh, let's park that for now. The other thing that you've mentioned now is this concept of a goal. And this is another term that I think needs a little bit of unpacking, because it's actually not necessarily as clear as it may sound. For example, when I look at a physics context, let's say statistical physics, on the one hand, we could describe a statistical system, let's say a collection of particles, as just particles randomly bouncing around and interacting. And we would not think of any of this as goal-directed behavior. But there is another level of description of that system, which is the, the description of entropy, um, which we believe will, will always increase the statistical property of this collection of particles. And there really is a way in which that could be considered to be a goal. The system could be said to have the goal of increasing entropy. And there are many other systems like this. But what comes to mind for me there is that this this word goal is very different from how we use it in other contexts. You know, these, these particles manifest this behavior of increasing entropy, but there is no volition there. There's no sort of agent seeking to optimize that goal. It's, it's just something that happens because of how statistics works. And so... I would love to understand more how you how you see this word goal in goal directed behavior. For example, is is volition required for uh, the the goal seeking in your view? Well, um, yeah. So so you start to tread a, a, a dangerous ground when when you start to say there's no no volition and no agent there. So so let's 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 warm up to this uh, as, as follows. Um, goals what, what, to to me, what's valuable about the notion of goal is simply this. Uh, in an engineer, so I take an engineering approach to all of this. So my framework is called TAME, Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. It's literally a technological approach. So it's an engineering approach. So uh, to me, what a goal is is the following: If I were to build something using this as using whatever system we're talking about as a part, what can I count on it to do without my being there to micromanage? That's it. So if 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 you have a thermostat, it has a little tiny goal, and and the reason you know that. Is because it has it 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 it, it empirically uh, favors you as an engineer to know that it has this goal because then you can use it in your device. You don't have to know how it's built. Actually, it might be a black box. You don't have to know. You don't have to know much other than the fact that it is going to pursue within certain parameters. It is going to pursue this goal. Knowing that gives you great advantage over a different engineer that doesn't believe in goals and only believes in. We can talk about it if you want. I we have some thoughts on um. This kind of uh, Laplacian the demon reductionism approach, which I think <clears throat> is it really puts puts engineers at a dis, dis, disadvantage. So 
when I say goal, I don't mean it has the kind, the 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 level of goal that a human might have, which is a which is a a human goal. Often, I mean, many times it's not, but many times it could be a second order metacognitive goal. Like I know that my goal is. That's not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> goals come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Little tiny goals are very modest, but they offer the engineer an advantage when you know about them. So 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 that that's what I mean by goal. So now so now let's go back to this. So so you're talking about various least action principles and things like this in physics, where <clears throat> uh, where where and and so we we ask ourselves. Is that really on the same, even on the same spectrum as my real human goals? Well, for two reasons. So I'm gonna I'm gonna argue that it is, and I'm gonna argue that in two ways. Number one, uh, if you thought that it wasn't, okay, then then what you would have to do is you would have to. So so here you are as a human, and you have real goals. Um, some number of years and nine months ago, you were a single cell. And that was well described by statistical physics and everything else. So at some point during, so so now we've nailed down the two ends of this of this continuum, and now you probably see where I'm going with this. Let's walk backwards from today, where you have these full blown goals, and you you owe a story. If you don't believe that they're on this that that the goals of physics and the goals of co co cognition are on the same continuum, you owe a story about where they wink out, where real goals disappear as you walk backwards. Now. There someday there may be such a story, and people will talk about phase transitions and more is different and things like that. But nobody actually has a theory of this. I've never seen a good one. I've just seen a lot of people who believe there really must be one. And so, because developmental biology is smooth and gradual, it does not give you any any magical um, time point at which boom at this stage ah there you go uh, now we've gone from physics to real real cognitive goals that just doesn't happen and so and so that's so that's one is that is that you are then you are then committed to to having a story like this and maybe somebody will come up with one someday but i've never seen one um <clears throat> the other the other reason uh, i believe these are uh, on on exactly the same continuum is that they match my definition so so let's think about um let's think about uh uh a, 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 <clears throat> um, a roller coaster Right, physics. You know, pure physics. There's no, there's no complex mind there. As an engineer, I've got to work pretty hard to get that thing up the up the up the hill. But guess what? I don't have to do. I don't have to do anything about getting it down the hill. It'll do that on its own. Is that a big complex goal like a human goal? No, of course not. But is it zero? It isn't zero. It's something I, as an engineer, can count on this system doing. So of course, it doesn't look like big goals. But if 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 from an evolutionary perspective. We have to ask where these goals come from, where our goals come from, and therefore we have to ask what is the minimal, the smallest, you know, what is the what is the absolute basement level of of, of goals? And it, of course, it's if of course it's not going to look like a complex human level goal. It's going to be something little, very tiny, and by definition, is going to be something that people will argue about. It's kind of like the origin of life. If you really had, if you really had the origin of life, a model for the origin of life. It would have to be one that people would argue: is that really life or isn't it? If they're not arguing, you're not really at the origin of life. You're too far one one direction or the other. So the same thing with these goals. You get down to this. It has to be that way. It has to be this like uh, controversial example that stretches our conventional large complex kind of notion. So I think so. So this is an interesting question. People have asked me: Do I think that in in uh, is there any such is there anything that's on um, that has zero cognition? In this universe, and so I'm starting. So I start to think, and I think, okay, what's the what is the minimal criterion that I want for something to be on that spectrum? Well, I would like to. I, I think the absolute minimum basement level has to have two features. One feature is that the optimal uh, description of what it's going to do next is not derivable purely from local variables, right? So you can't you can't just look at exactly what's going on right now, right around it, and that determines everything you need to know about it. So that's so that's one. And two, it has to have some minimal ability of goal directedness. And what I mean by that is some ability to get to a particular state despite perturbations. You see, the thing about goals is, is not simply that, well, it goes from here to there, and therefore I think it's a goal. No, it's it's what level of, of um, a competency does it have to get to that goal despite various things that, that happen. And so that means you can't tell, you can't estimate goals by watching observational data. You have to do experiments, you have to do perturbational experiments. So having said that, <clears throat> I will then it then it then looks like uh, even at the basic particle level you already have this because you have quantum indeterminacy and you have least action principles. They're not much. They, you know these are not human level goals, but 
but they are exactly what I would think the the minimal version of that has to look like. So so I would say, and this is provisional, but at the at the moment, I would say that I think in this world, I don't. I think everything is to some extent on the continuum. I asked I asked Chris Fields once, who knows a lot more of physics than I do, what it would take to have a universe with no 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 least action principles, and he basically said it would be it would be a universe in which nothing happens. It would just be static. Then 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 there wouldn't be any. So, um, you know, that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me that it's baked in, that this kind of co uh, uh, basal cognition is baked into any universe. At the And then, of course, what life is really good at is scaling it up such that you don't just get a pile of rocks, which does exactly the same thing as all the component pebbles do. But what life does is actually scale up this, this cognition. So much of what you've said there just screams to move on to your paper on endless forms. But before we do, I think we really need to unpack this concept of goals a little bit further. In particular, I'd like to understand where we think this concept lives. And by this, I mean, well, let me start with an analogy. There's the famous paradox of the, uh, the heap in philosophy, which goes something like, how many grains of sand does it take to make a heap? And you look at you know, one grain of sand, two grains of sand. The answer is obviously no, that's not a heap. Um, and then you look at a very large number of grains of sand, and clearly it is a heap. And the question is, at, at what point does it transition from non-heap to heap? And I think most people agree that really this question isn't quite a paradox, because we understand that the concept, in this case, heap, is something that exists not in the physical world itself, but in our minds. It's, it's a concept that we apply to the world to describe certain classes of relationships between grains of sand. And, and we do this all the time in other concepts as well. Um, and I wonder if this, this word goal is serving the same function here, where you know we look at, on the one hand, a system of particles in physics, and they're obeying certain physical laws. And we wouldn't really think of that as goal-directed behavior in, in the same way as in the grain of sand case, we wouldn't consider a couple grains of sand a heap behavior. Um, but nonetheless, at a sort of higher level of abstraction, we do consider these particles bouncing around, exhibiting high order properties to be exhibiting goal directed behavior. And so my challenge there is, is the, the word goal sort of uh, facing us with the same problem here? Is this just a concept that lives in the mind? And uh, and does, does that sort of resolve the difficulty we're, we're facing pinning down this term? Yeah, uh, great, great point. Um, I would I would make one one twist in this, which is the the, the actually the, the the idea of the paradox of the heap is actually very very salient here. Um, I think I think it's more than just in our minds in the following sense. Uh, this is where again a, a, an engineering perspective really helps. When somebody calls me and says. Uh, I need you to come move this heap. What the salient question is, what tools do I need for this? Do I need a spoon? Do I need a shovel? Do I need a, a you know, a, a bulldozer? What, what are we talking about? And so that's where I think the rubber meets the road. It's not just a concept in our mind, but neither is it some um, kind of uh, objective hard fact with, with, uh, with hard boundaries. What it is, is it's an, it's a, it's an engineering protocol claim. So when somebody says to you, I have a pile or a mountain or a, or a, you know, or a speck, what are they telling you? The concept is irrelevant. What they're really telling you is what tools are you going to bring to bear to work on this? And so that is exactly the kind of frame that you need to understand the biological sense of goals. Because when you say to me, my, uh, here's a system and it has no, I don't believe this thing has goals. What you're saying to me is that all the tools in my toolkit for uh, rational discourse for training with rewards and punishments for resetting con uh, set points. None of those things will work in the system. And if I believe you, I think, ah, well, you must have something like a bowling ball that's just going to go where it goes. And it's, it's, uh, all, all of its, um, uh, trajectories are well described by the local environment. And there's really not much internal structure that there for me to work with. I really have to just work on the low level physical forces. If I wanted to go somewhere else, on the other hand, uh, I might say, yeah, but are you sure? Because last time you told me that and you were talking about a gene regulatory network and you turned out to be wrong because I turned out to be able to train the thing and you had no idea. So so, so, so now, right, uh, I think we have to be very, very suspicious of this because a lot of people use these in uh, as, as philosophical pronouncements. They sort of sit in their armchair and go, 
that can't be a goal or this doesn't have cognition, right? But these are all empirical claims. You have to treat them as empirical claims. And you have to ask yourself, has anybody tried training it? Is it possible that this thing might be might have some sort of internal state that is actually, I asked a question recently, and this was just, you know, more for, um, just kind of to shake up this kind of thinking, but I asked uh, on, on my Twitter feed, I asked if, if there was any reason why uh, elementary particles couldn't be trained. So do we know for a fact that if you were to shake a proton, let's say in a magnetic field or something like this, that the thousandth time you do it, you're not going to get a different response than the first 999 times you did it. Who knows if this, right? Is it, is it possible that this thing has some sort of habituation, some hysteresis, something? Uh, that was just to point out that you can take things that are completely uh, unconventional, you know, they call them, um, uh, uh, well, yeah, unconventional is a good word, uh, unconventional uh, substrate for these kinds of things. And you ask what tools are available. So so to me, all of these things are engineering protocols claims. That's it. Verif it's empirically testable engineering protocol claims. So when you tell me that something has or doesn't have a certain level of cognition or goals or, or thinking or anything else, what you're really telling me is, I, he, here is the here is the set of techniques from which discipline I think are appropriate here. Maybe just chemistry, maybe uh, a behavior science, maybe psychiatry, and maybe someplace in maybe computers, you know, computer science, maybe someplace in between. So I think I think I think you're you're right on that. That's that's exactly it. But it's not that it's just a concept in our mind. It's a it's an it's a claim for uh, a protocol for relating to the system. Yeah, you've mentioned several forms now of what I would call unconventional cognition. And in the paper you sent me, there you mentioned several forms of unconventional kinds of life or exotic kinds of life, certainly things that most people probably wouldn't have heard of. Before we get into it, let's talk about the, the title of the paper. The, the paper is called Endless Forms Most Beautiful 2.0, Teleonomy and the Bioengineering of Chimeric and Synthetic Organisms. Can you tell me what is this paper about and why this title? Yeah, um, well, it's a couple of things. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there's this. Uh, we we talked a little bit before about this this notion of teleophobia, and 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 uh, I try to uh, I, I wanted to get back to this idea of of teleology, which is which is systems with goals, and in particular, there's a there's a twist on it, which is teleonomy, which is which is uh, defined as systems with apparent goals. And typically, the way people use that is they think that uh, teleonomy is kind of a, a hedge. You know, you don't really want to say it has real goals. That would be too 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 scary, and and you know, people would be upset. You can you can say it's it just looks like it has goals, and then we can sort of get get on with the science, and we don't have to. Okay, so so I think it's actually much more profound than that. I think the point is that all goals are in the eyes of an observer. Goals are to be defined by some observer that's interacting with a system. By the way, maybe the system itself. It could well be for complex systems. It could be the system itself. You know, kind of like um, Mike Gazaniga's story of the of the of the explainer in your brain that actually tells stories about why you did things. Um, <clears throat> so, so teleonomy to me is is emphasizes this idea that there are observers that see various systems as goal directed systems. And so that's the first thing I wanted to do in this paper is is talk about that. The second thing is. Uh, really, really start to chip away at uh, the notion of binary categories for uh, different uh, types of entities or, or, or systems in, uh, in biology, in, in um, robotics, in, in uh, synthetic biology and psychology and so on. So people have this, <clears throat> this, this, this generic idea that uh, everybody knows what a human is. I mean, you know, here you go. Here's a typical adult human. That's a human. And so I have a I have a slide that that I use in various talks where I start where I try to break that down because because I really want us to think carefully about what it, what it, what do we really mean by these essential categories and and another one another one is is machine you know living being versus machine that's another one that gets people all crazy is when when I refer to to biologicals as as, as machines and we can we can talk about that but but in this in this diagram um, <clears throat> what you have is you have a standard issue modern human in the middle and uh, then sort of going up is this whole evolutionary history all the way back into unicellular uh, uh, um, uh, microbes. And what it emphasizes is that whatever you think this human has, uh, there's, uh, you know, certain types of metacognitive capacities and memories and, and hopes and dreams and moral worth and responsibilities and, and blameworthiness and all this kind of stuff. It goes smoothly all on an evolutionary timescale all the way back to microbes. 
whatever that human has, if you don't think it's a continuum, you got to tell me where it disappears. Just walk it backwards. And if you think that modern human has, you know, the, the responsibilities to do things and true whatever's, well, at some point, some kind of hominid ancestor or, or some kind of primate or something would have had to have that. And its parents didn't. That's what you're really telling me that in one generation, right? Because if not, if it's a slow and gradual process, well, then, then we're on the same page. It goes all the way back. You have to, you have to kind of figure out where it comes and goes. So that's, that's going up, going down the same thing on a, on a individual time scale. So, so again, you, whatever you have, well, you were once an embryo and then, and then, and then some, some blastomeres and then an egg before that. So again, you, you have to tell a story about the scaling of these things. So to me, all of this is about not figuring out hard categories where things are present or absent, but instead telling a process level transformation story. How did it scale? How did the tiny little goals of, you know, of, of meta, little, little tiny metabolic goals of microbes scale up to morphogenetic goals, to human behavioral goals and, and so on, right? You're telling a story of, of, of transformation and scaling, not, not, of, not of hard boundaries. Now it gets now for this paper it gets even worse because so that that's kind of the horizontal continuum. There's a there's a uh, that that's the vertical continuum. There's a horizontal continuum which is this. To the right are all the different ways to modify that standard human with uh with engineered artifacts. So maybe they got some glasses and maybe they got an iPhone and maybe they got a robotic hand and maybe they've got a microchip in their brain and maybe they're actually a brain on wheels with some tentacles in the back and maybe they're you know living in a computer altogether and again all of this is smooth and continuous and so we can tell all kinds of stories about creatures that are 98 percent human with a little bit of, of microchip in their brain or something that's a Roomba with a little bit of human cells on board to help it to navigate right and, and everything in between so so that's that's kind of to the right and then to the left are all the biological changes so you've got that human maybe he's got a third hemisphere or maybe he's got some gills that we've modified or maybe we've emerged him with a plant or who all of this is possible right all of these things are biologically possible so again it's a story of smooth transformation and what it forces you to do is ask yourself what's the essential part when i say something is a human or or you know a machine or a whatever whatever it is What's really the essential part of it? And, and one thing that we're very firm on in this paper is this idea that in previous times, uh, we relied on certain criteria for these hard categories. So let's just talk about you know machines and 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 life forms. What you could do in the past was walk over and knock and, and sort of like like rap on something with your knuckles. And if you heard a metallic clangy sound, you could make some conclusions. You would say that this thing is going to be pretty boring. It's going to be easy to predict. It's going to be have been made in a factory, not evolved. And uh, you, by the way, have the uh, the right to do whatever you want to it. Take it apart, turn it into a you know a vacuum cleaner or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, if you were to tap it and you sort of hear this like th soft um, you know, kind of uh, thud and it's warm, then you could conclude that okay, it is a product of natural evolution. It might be interesting. It will behave in novel ways. It has its own sort of complex uh, inner life, and uh, I, there's certain things I'm not allowed to do to it because it has moral moral value. Now, that that was nice and easy before, um, but uh, but 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 it was based on criteria that are that are that are junk. These these criteria are a consequence of failures of technology and imagination in the past. We are well beyond that. We now we now have um, lots of uh, lots of machines that are designed by an evolutionary process. We have biologicals that have uh, human engineering involved. We have all kinds of chimeras and hybrids and hybrids and every possible combination of these things. And so we have to move and 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 hopefully this this is not a, a, sh a shock to, to to too many people because because I think we've been going this way socially for a long time. Uh, the point being that, the some the origin story of a system where it came from whether it was evolved or designed and the composition what does it look like are really terrible guides to how you're supposed to relate to something you should not be making decisions of how you relate to something based on what it looks like and how it got here there are far more important ways to uh to to that, that to, for more important things that you need to pay attention to and so so that's what we tried to do in this paper by really talking about all the different ways that biology and uh, uh, engineered artifacts can coexist in the same body to point out that we really are heading towards a much more mature ethics where 
we are not using these these bad proxies such as such as whether you were evolved or designed and and, and what you look like yeah we, we've certainly seen that in other areas of life yeah, what comes to mind is peter singer's book uh, or his concept on the expanding circles where he sort of talks about the expanding circles of empathy people you know first caring for themselves and then their families uh, wider tribes and uh, increasingly extending to you know more distant genetic relatives uh, so that concept does seem to apply here. Um, in your paper, you actually mentioned several very interesting, what you've called exotic forms of life, things like cyborgs and hybrids and animats, uh, a whole, whole number of others, many that I'd never heard of. And uh, nonetheless, you've considered them life. I would love to get your thoughts. What is, the, what is the utility of considering some of these forms of life as, well, life instead of machine is there is utility in some contexts of distinguishing life from from machine uh, i I, th I think there's no no utility in trying to make that binary um trying to trying to upkeep those those binary categories i don't i don't think you gain anything by that i think i think much more interesting is the question for any given system uh what kind of cognition does it have and how much that's what you really want to know so you can, and, and of course, as usual, science fiction is way, way ahead of us uh, on having dealt with these issues 100 years ago. Um, you know, your, 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 your spouse comes home one day and they say, um, yeah, I've had some toes replaced. They're electronic now. And you say, well, who cares? And then they say, well, actually, I've had a bunch of other organs replaced. And you say, well, OK, who cares? And they say, well, actually, I've had some of my brain replaced. And maybe who cares? And then and so you ask yourself wait, what do I care about? Like what, you know, if, if about your spouse, about your best friend, about somebody with whom you're going to, you're going to go off and live on Mars or whatever, what do you really want to know? Right. Is, is what you really want to know what kind of DNA they have? I don't think so. Is, is, do you really want to know what kind of, um, you know, what their skin looks like or what, what, uh, I don't think any of those things are really what you want to know. What you really want to know, I think is, uh, do you, do you share uh, do you share the ability to um, uh, to what, what basically what I call in a, in, a, in a paper from a couple of years ago, I call it a cognitive light cone. It's the size of it's spatial temporal size of the goals you're able to have. Mm -hmm. So uh, if some if 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 a system has a, a cognitive light cone uh, that is, you know, for the, uh, appropriate to a, to a, to a flea or a dog or, or, or some other kind of animal where, where it's really much smaller than yours. So the kinds of things they care about are only things that are basically happening in a very short time frame in a close, in a, in a short distance, right? Your, your dog is never going to care about what happens four months from now, 10 miles over. They just can't, it's impossible. So creatures that have a very different cognitive light cone from you, certain um, kinds of relationships are not possible. Right. And conversely, by the way, if somebody has an enormous light cone and you can't even comprehend the things they're worried about, right? So, you know, somebody is a, is a, is a bodhisattva like agent that, that literally cares about um, every living thing in the world. They can actually care about that. And they have all these cosmic goals. What kind of, what, 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 what could you possibly, you know, how could you possibly relate to that system? So, um, so, so that's, that's what I think is, is really cr crucial here is that, uh, we shouldn't be trying to figure out whether something is a machine or or alive or a human. This is this is all useless. What you really want to know is what kind of a relationship can I have with the system? What 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 do we have in common such that we can? Is this something I'm going to control? Is it something I'm going to train? Is it something I'm going to learn from? Is it something I'm going to have a a peer to peer you know sort of uh, friendship with or, or or whatever? That that's what you really care about. And those kinds of things that can um, uh, uh, increasingly now. We are going to live in a future. This is pretty much guaranteed, assuming that we sort of stay alive in general. Uh, we are pretty much guaranteed to be surrounded by systems that are unrecognizable to 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 uh, the past uh, be beings in the past. They're not going to share anything with us uh, on the tree of life. They're not going to be anywhere because that's how we do it now. You sort of look at something and you say, "Well, it kind of looks like a fish. I know what to do with you know. I know how to relate to things on that on that level of the tree." Uh, -uh they're not going to be on that tree at all. And so th that that's what's going to be important is what kind of relationship you can have with them. Well, there's several interesting points to follow up on there, but one in particular is this idea that we can sort of assess accurately what is and what is not worth caring about. Uh, you know, for example, if I if I take the cyborg example, I think we have typically this sort of gut reaction that this is a, a robot and it's it's not really alive and therefore is not worth caring about but 
you know, it seems that what you might be saying is that 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 sense, that instinct, is more a reflection on how our own minds work uh, than necessarily a reflection of what's true and out there in the world, and you know whether this this cyborg or whatever other being it is is truly worth caring about. The thing is that in any given case, you might be right or you might be wrong. So so if somebody takes right so so if somebody takes a mannequin and uh, sort of. Uh, uh, wheels it in and says, "Look, this is now you're going to be your best friend." You, you having having interacted with the system and convinced yourself what it's uh, what it's capable of and what it's you know what its cognitive structure is, you might be right in saying that. Okay, I really don't need to worry about the feelings of this uh, of this mannequin. Um, but you know, let's just keep in mind h- humans have a really long history of treating things and other humans poorly because of perceived fundamental differences. So it used to be that you could look at somebody that was basically the same as you, but maybe they had a different a different shade or a different origin or a different whatever. And then you could conclude that, ah, well, this is something that's other. This isn't in my tribe. I don't really care about them. We're going to, you know, whatever, right? We, we have a long history of, of doing that to others. And so I think uh, we need to be extremely careful about stuff like that. And not to say that you can't, again, you can't make a mistake in either directions. I mean, I've seen people who try to marry the Eiffel Tower and things like this, right? So that does exist, you know, it, it can go really pathological. But um, uh, we really have to uh, uh, be very careful about our uh, innate, uh, how, how easy it is for us to 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 um, label as other beings as not worthy of moral consideration because they differ from us in really uh, irrelevant ways. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I certainly agree with that. Um, however, I do, I do feel like we're starting to tread on fairly dangerous ground here when we're talking about issues of morality and ethics uh, without bringing in the concept of consciousness. I mean, in, in my view, and I think many people take this view, um, consciousness is a prerequisite in some sense for a, a morality or an ethic uh, in the sense that, you know, something can be moral only insofar as it has an influence over the experience of some conscious being. And, um, you know, by, by that token, things that are fully unconscious, you know, like a rock, it doesn't really have a moral status. And I wonder if this cognitive light cone concept actually is being used as somewhat of a proxy for consciousness. You know, if we, if we did have a fully fledged theory of consciousness and how it worked, across all these different systems, would that potentially be a better foundation for an ethic? Um, and is what we're saying here um, that, you know, in, in absence of that, that uh, you know, fundamental theory of consciousness, we have this cognitive light cone description uh, that can serve as a good proxy. And, you know, if we assume that consciousness somehow relates to cognitive capacity in some way, then let's stick with a proxy because we have a, a better grip of, of how that works. Is that an accurate characterization of what you're saying? I think that, uh, I, I, th- I think f- for practical purposes, uh, much like the word adult is useful for practical purposes, but really not sharp in any, in any, in any real way. Um, I, I think the cognitive light cone could be a perfectly reasonable proxy because because we need we need proxies badly. I'm not saying that's the right one, but 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 we need them, and I think it's a decent start. Okay, I'm sure somebody will come up with something better eventually, but I think it's a decent start. Um, uh, with respect to uh, whether whether consciousness is is at the root of morality, I mean, this is a tough question. Uh, I, I know, you know, various people who. Um, uh, really don't believe there is such a thing as consciousness. They generally are pretty nice people. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's required to have a standard view on consciousness to 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 understand the 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 value of uh, of, of of certain kinds of behavior. But um, overall, so so here's my here's my thing on me. I'll, I'll say a few things about consciousness, and then maybe maybe we can get back to that to that question. It'll shed some light on it. Um, what what I don't have is a a new theory of consciousness to offer, right? Many people have done it, much smarter people than me. So I, I, at the moment, I don't have a um, uh, I don't have a theory of con- a, a new theory of consciousness. What I do have are some thoughts about it. Um, one one thought is this: the reason that the reason that uh, consciousness is such a thorny problem is that for every other kind of theory we know what form the output of that theory is going to take. 
So if you have a theory about uh, about uh, uh, physics or behavior or whatever, we, we you, you may not know what the answer is, but you know what the answer is going to look like. You know what you're going to get, the output of the theory, right? It's going to be some numbers or some predictions, whatever. Uh, for consciousness, we really don't have much of an idea of if, if you had a correct theory of consciousness, what would it output? Because if it outputs anything about brain states or observable behaviors, that's not a theory of consciousness. That's a theory of behavior or brain or brain physiology. What the heck would a proper theory of consciousness output? So I think what a, a proper theory of consciousness would output, again, is a protocol, a, an engineering protocol for putting you in the same state that this thing is predicting. So if you say, okay, uh, here is, I've made, I've made a cat with three hemispheres and, you know, and an eye on its tail. Uh, what's it like to be that, that creature? A, a, a proper theory of consciousness could only give you an answer by putting you in whatever state that cat is in. Now, if that's impossible while you remain you, that's just not going to happen. What is kind of possible, and, and I go through this at the, at the last figure of that tame paper, what's kind of possible is to merge you with a system that you're interested in. You're still not going to know what it's like to be that system, but the two, but the two of you together now are going to find out what it's like to be a component, the, 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 the hybrid system. So for example, right? So, so, so when I study a brain in third person, I use, I, I, I'm looking at a screen that has data on it, these electrodes in, in your brain, and, and I see your brain states. And then I say, right, so that's very much a third person interaction, right? It's, it's science. I, I don't know any, I, I don't know anything about your consciousness really there. What I see is a bunch of information on your brain physiology. Then I say, ah, these, uh, these kinds of um, this this computer monitor. This is really low low bandwidth. I don't, I don't like this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the the output of your um, uh, the output of, of of these electrodes. I'm going to stick them directly into my brain, and then I'm going to kind of feel what you feel. And so so now we're getting closer here, right? It's kind of third person, but not really. And then you say, ah, this this uh, the, these electrodes are are, are just uh, too too low 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 bandwidth too. Uh, uh, why don't why don't we just fuse our brains the way that the corpus callosum fuses our left and right hemispheres? Let's just really get get together. And now we, much like conjoined twins who share portions of the brain, and there are people in that in that state. Um, now now we really get to share a kind of consciousness. Now I don't I still don't get to find out what it's like to be you, but now we find out what it's like to be us. It's it's part of the way there. So I think the thing about consciousness is that uh, unlike, unlike normal third-person science, which you can do while remaining the same, so you can do a lot of chemistry and physics experiments and you're not changed by it, you're, you, you, know, you just do, do whatever you do in the world, you can, I, I don't believe you can learn about, re really learn about consciousness and stay the same. Consciousness is the, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, the old, the old uh, uh, alchemists used to say this, the difference between alchemy and chemistry is that you can do chemistry and you're still you. Alchemy is when you change. That's that's the difference, right? The real the real business of it is that is that you don't come out of it the way you came in if you're really going to learn something about this. So I think I think that's a real barrier to to really knowing it, knowing much about consciousness is that you have to become part of the experiment. The other thing the other thing I'll I'll say about consciousness is that um, uh, if if you look at the various popular theories of consciousness, most of them. Uh, will say something about why it is that the brain is conscious. Maybe, you know, uh, uh, um, Hameroff will say it's in the microtubules. Somebody else will say it's in the magnetic field. Somebody else will say it's because of a certain pattern. You know, Tononi will say it's a certain pattern of, of, of information integration and so on. So, uh, so you look at these theories, and for the vast majority of them, every tissue in the body matches those criteria. Most of these theories, in fact, do not distinguish between brain tissue and other tissues. Now, now they don't talk about this, and because nobody wants to, nobody wants to think about consciousness outside the brain. But the fact is that if you believe in consciousness for the reasons that that theory says, you ought to believe that it's very possible that that the other tissues and organs in your body have their own primitive consciousness. Is it verbal? No, almost certainly not. But uh, it's um, and 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 what people usually say. So so when I when I mention this, what people usually say is. Well, well, that's crazy. I don't feel like my liver's conscious. I, I'm, I'm a unified. I don't feel like I'm made of, of nine, you know, ninety different consciousnesses. I feel unified. Well, you don't feel my consciousness either. Of course, you don't. Uh, the, the, you, 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 the verbal. What I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm having a conversation with mostly your left hemisphere and some other stuff. So, yeah, you don't feel that your liver is conscious, but you don't feel that I'm conscious either. You sort of assume that from watching my behavior. And, and if you were to watch, if you had a way to 
uh, directly sense the behavior that your inner organs have in physiological space, you would certainly recognize them as intelligent because you would see them solving problems on a daily basis, doing all kinds of clever things to deal with all the stressors and everything else. And for the same reasons you think that my brain is conscious by, by watching what you know, whatever your favorite theory is, you ought to be able to 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 uh, to envision that you're you may have other consciousnesses in the body. And we know this is true. There's we know this is true because of the split brain patients, dissociative states. And that's just in the brain. Who knows how many are in there? Uh, but also the rest of the body. So. Um, I, you know, I think consciousness is a, is a really thorny problem. I think it's very difficult to deal with it in third person. And I definitely don't think that we should be waiting for a resolution to that problem to establish a set of ethics around, uh, other, other proxies, which we do anyway. Right. I mean, the reality is you don't know that I'm conscious and, and, and the reason that, that, that we are going to be nice to each other is not because you figured out some way of sharing my consciousness. Really. It's because we have to we have to we have to sort of get on and make, uh, get on with life and make a make an assumption which is which is going to keep you out of the worst sort of moral for, you know failures by failing to recognize that something is conscious and it's and it's and it's nice and easy when something looks like you and it has the same architecture like you but let's face it in the wide universe do we really think that the only agents that matter have you know people people say all the time um uh like in these uh, uh, conferences where they talk about brain organs and whatever, the, the, there's always an ethics panel and they always worry about, well, is this thing like a human brain or how much like a human brain is it? Do we really think that in the, in the, in the you know, enormous universe, the only things worth caring about are ones with a brain exactly like ours? I mean, that seems ridiculous to me, right? It's, 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 it's got to be the case that there are other ways to make systems that, are, that have moral worth. It can't all just be like our frontal cortex. So, so, so anyway, so that's, so that's my spiel. I, th I think consciousness is, is, is really hard and we can't wait for that to get resolved in order to, uh, to, 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 um, you know, treat properly other systems that, that may deserve it. Yeah. I mean, take that as a public service announcement. That's a message I can certainly get behind. Uh, it's deeply philosophical line to myself and, and actually a position of somebody who I've been in touch with recently and I hope to have on the podcast in the future, uh, who is Anil Seth. Anil Seth is a very well-known consciousness researcher in neuroscience. And he has this more practical approach to consciousness, which he terms the, the real problem of consciousness, as opposed to the, the hard problem or the class of easy problems of consciousness. And this is basically the uh, problem of being able to explain, predict and control conscious experiences from a phenomenological perspective. So from the self-reported first person, I guess, nature of the experience seems to be very deeply sort of philosophically aligned to, to your more practical approach to this question. And, and I agree, it's urgent. It is absolutely urgent with what is happening with um, computers uh, getting faster and the, the progression of AI. Um, you know, we, we really don't know what's going on in, in these systems and what could go on. And potentially, you're right, there, there are conscious systems that might deserve more or systems that deserve more, whether or not we know they're conscious. Uh, this is actually a really nice segue into the final section of your paper, which presents what I would say is a, is a pretty profound new idea. Uh, the, the title of the section is Towards a New Ethics Based on Deep Agency in the Option Space of Life. Could you expand a little bit on the idea in this section? Sure. And, and I want to be clear up front, uh, I, I'm, I'm not actually offering a specific system of ethics. So this is way, way beyond my pay grade to, uh, to, to, to think I'm going to design something like that. Um, what I am offering are uh, what I think are some facts that any viable system of ethics is going to have to come to live with. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to point out that, that in the future, some of the, some of the familiar guideposts are going to be gone. We can't rely on those anymore. They were never any good to begin with, but, but they were okay while, while we didn't really understand what was going on. Um, no, no more excuse for that. Uh, we have to now deal with this. And so, and so I try to point that out. And one kind of interesting thing is that, uh, it may also sound a little bit confusing where certain other places like i have a i have a couple of papers with josh bongard where we talk about uh the notion of machine and uh not not the not the you know uh 1800s version of a machine but the modern version of a machine and why living things are in fact a kind of machine and and so that to, to many people that sounds like it's at odds with my sort of expansive ethics view on you know why if, well, if everything's a machine aren't you saying that then anything goes and you don't have to so so let me let me just uh, say a couple of things about that um 
what I mean by by all by all of this stuff, this is really fundamental. And uh, uh, I sort of credit a lot of early conversations that I had with Chris Fields about this, who really emphasizes the role of the observer, not just in microscopic physics, but but in in all facts of facets of science. Um, the machine, the machine uh, metaphor is a kind of lens. It's a lens that you use to uh, interact with various systems, and it's specifically a lens based on the notion of control, of manipulation. In other words, something is a machine to the extent that it is amenable to various degrees of control. So from that perspective, you can certainly look at living systems as machines. They're not, they're not magic. They don't just do whatever the heck they feel like. They obey laws. And to the extent that we understand those laws, and I don't just mean the laws of chemistry and physics, I mean the laws of computation, the laws of um, of, of behavioral science and so on, we can come up with um, efficacious interventions that predict and control those systems. And this is true for, for, for human behavior. It's true for physiology. It's true for, 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 for microbial uh, you know, chemistry, all, all of those things. So from that perspective, they can be uh, interacted with as machines, for sure. Now, there are other lenses. There are other lenses that have to do with relationships. And there might be another lens that you might adopt to some, with, with someone uh, of, of sufficient uh, cognitive light cone size, where you say, my goal isn't to control you. My goal is to learn from you, to have some sort of a relationship with you, to find out what, you know, to, to, to basically benefit from your agency, to benefit from the fact that... Uh, I don't. I don't need to be the one in in charge. I'm gonna. I'm gonna gain something by letting you be in charge of, of a conversation, of the behavior, of whatever. And because because you're capable of it, and because we are impedance matched for the kind of intelligence that we have, and and right, and um, and we're gonna gain by this. So that's another lens. So my point is that there is no fact of the matter about whether something is a machine. The the, the only thing that exists are observers. That might be using a machine lens or an agential lens to, of some degree to deal with a particular to have a relationship with a particular system. So it isn't an, an uh, you know an, uh, it isn't binary and it isn't an objective fact. It's all observer dependent. So yes, biological systems are often amenable to machine metaphors, and yes, some biological systems and many non-biological systems increasingly will be amenable to a kind of a far more agential perspective. So. Uh, that in no way uh, uh, contradicts the need for an expanded system of ethics. Because if something is a machine, part of what makes it a machine might be a complex set of psychological laws that, yeah, you could exploit them in that way, but ethics is what tells you whether you should or not, right? And so that applies to, to various kinds of machine lenses as much as it does to, to agential lenses. So that's, that's kind of my, my um, thoughts on that. Well, Michael, I could speak to you for hours and hours on this point. And when I reflect on this conversation, I see we've covered so many different topics in so much depth. And in every direction I look, there are so many mysteries and unsolved problems. Your work really does touch so many different areas. Uh, if we were to take a step back and actually look at it as a whole, you know, if you, you could look at all of these areas and answer just one outstanding question in your field, do you have a sense of which that would be? Um, I think, I think all of it boils down. So, so I'll be greedy and try to get everything in one, in one question. Um, I think, I think all of this boils down to the scaling of cognition. Um, I want to know how you get from, or how, how life gets from the minuscule proto cognitive, uh, uh, cybernetic capacities of particles up to what we are as humans and whatever is beyond, because I'm sure we're not the top of the food chain ultimately. So, so it's the, to me, it's the scaling. Everything boils down to the scaling. How does that cognitive light cone grow? How do, how does um, collective intelligence work, right? How do you scale the uh, basic uh, uh, tiny little competencies of individual subunits into a bigger whole that works, solves bigger problems and bigger problem spaces and uh, and does more clever things that that scaling to me underlies the whole the whole business well i'm sure based on that and really everything we've talked about our listeners are going to want to find you and find more of what you've what you've said and what you've written where do you want to send them where should people look to find your stuff absolutely everything is at drmichaellevin.org so that's the website www.drmichaellevin.org one word um, i also have a twitter feed which is at drmichaellevin 
um, and everything everything is on that is on that website. Uh, all the all the all the papers, the talks, the uh, the protocols, software um, are insp the inspiration for a lot of uh, what I'm talking about. Um, I put up uh, you know videos of uh, conversations that I have with various people. Uh, every everything is everything is there. Well, I'll make sure to include those in the show notes. Before we close, there was one other topic that we had mentioned to one another in our email exchange, uh, which was a topic that's actually very close to my heart and uh, often controversial. And I think this would be a good one to close on. Uh, that's the topic of free will. Now I have, I have strong views on this topic, but instead of sharing them, I would love to just get your unfiltered thoughts. I'm just going to pause there. Free will. Can you can you tell me what you think? Yeah. So so a couple of things on on free will. And again, I, I'm not going to claim to solve this this really complex problem, but just just kind of say a couple of things about it. One one is that this is now less of a scientific point and more of a personal point. I I, I know uh, there there are there are many people that are really really hung up on this question in the sense that they feel like if there is no free will. It it really matters, right? The, the you know it's going to matter to them. It's going to matter how they live their lives. It impacts them. It, it if they don't believe in free will, it depresses them, or or you know whatever they. It, and so I I just want to throw out throw out this 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 one perspective. Um, and and I think it has to do with free will. You know, in in a lot of science fiction, and in particular, there was this uh, recently there was this movie, you know, Ex Machina, and one of the one of the scenes is the guy the guy is starting to cut his cut his arm because because he's thinking, my God, what if what if I'm a robot, right? And I, I just want to throw out there that that I think far more important. I mean, scientifically, it's nice to know what we are, but 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 far more important uh, on a personal level than what we are is what we do. In other words, here you are, and I think I think this is one of those things that Descartes was 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 completely right about. Here here you are, and you have uh, various values and and goals, and and you can you can generate meaning, and you can have a meaning for life, and all that. If you discover that inside of you are a bunch of cogs and gears, let's say you 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 looked in your arm and said, "Holy, you know, holy crap! Here's here's a bunch of uh, you know gears and 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 screws and things." What you did not just discover is that, in fact, you don't have any of the magical things you thought you have. What you've discovered is that, well, I guess cogs and gears can have dreams and meaning. Then that's what you've discovered. You you've learned something about cogs and gears. You've learned you you haven't really reduced your own uh, uh, importance at all. So I want to be very clear. You you know we can we can debate free will um, all day long, but fundamentally, it is impossible to live as though you didn't believe in free will. I had I had lunch once with a with a philosopher who doesn't believe in free will, and when the waitress came over and she said, uh, "So so what will you have?" and uh, and and this philosopher started to try to choose a soup, and I said, "Hey, uh, what are you doing?" <laughs> maybe you should like sit back and see what soup was ordained for you by the by the by the you know the conditions at the start of the big bang it, it is impossible right you, you in the end you have to you have to live your life you have to make decisions whatever whatever uh philosophical stance we have on this it is it, it's a lot like i i treat this a lot like um those uh, kind of uh, Hume, Hume's uh, uh, skeptical arguments that oh maybe the whole universe was 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 created you know ten seconds ago including me and my memories like what if okay fine what use is any of that right it's completely sterile in in the sense of what you do next and so so on the practical level I think I think it is impossible to live your life as though free will doesn't exist I think that you need to embrace the fact that uh, what whatever whatever will is we have it. And we need to act as though we have it. We need to generate our own meaning and we need to have to go on to have a meaningful life. That's, that's, that's the personal level on the scientific level on the scientific level. I'll just say this, that I think, I think Dan Dennett was right in, uh, in, in, he, he had this, um, he had this dissection of the con of the popular concept where he said, look, you just zoom down to a, to the, to the physical facts of a given action. And all you're ever going to find is one of two things. You're either going to find f physical causes this caused that, and therefore whatever happened happened, or quantum indeterminacy or randomness, and therefore stuff happened. Neither one is what we mean by free will, right? So, so, so there you go. There's no free will. So, I, so, I, so I think he was right ab about that dissection of it. But, but the problem is that already gives up the game because it 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 insists from the start that uh, free will is to be found at a particular small size scale at a particular time. I don't think that's what we mean by free will. 
I think that if you were if you if you if you uh, freeze uh, time and look into the physical events at a particular time, that's right. You're never going to find anything that like what we call free will. I don't think we have free will um, in these in these little micro moments. Well, I think free will is a large scale concept of the ability to uh, change yourself over time. So so you don't have any uh, control over what your next thought is going to be. But you do have control over the distribution of thoughts you're going to have 10 years from now, because you can apply r- consistent practices. With, you, maybe you go to anger management, maybe you take a, you know, a meditation, maybe you do, who, who knows, right? But, but you have the ability to change what your cognitive structure is going to be at, in the future. It's not, it's not unlimited. Of course, you're still bound by various uh, physical aspects of your, of your, you know, of your apparatus and, and so on. And of course, environment, various other things. So, so there's not, there's, there's never complete freedom, right? You might ask freedom from what? So you don't have freedom from your own uh, desires, unless you work on that. You don't, and, and there's a whole, you know, there's a whole set of thought, you know, a kind of classic thought about that. Um, you don't have um, freedom from um, things you've learned in the past or experiences you've had, or uh, incompatible uh, incompatible needs that you might have, right? So there's you know there's there are mathematical um, uh, uh, kinds of uh, results. You know you don't have freedom from girls theorem, all these kinds of things, but you do have some degree. So 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 much like everything else, I think free will isn't a yes or no. I don't th- I don't think it's do do we have free will? The question is how much, what kind, and over what time scale? And and that's the interesting question. The interesting question is if I want to exert my my free will over my own cognitive structure what should I be doing and how do I live my life so that looking at the whole, you know, from for however long, you know, you have left looking at the structure, I say, ah, uh, this was led, this life was led according to the principles that, uh, that, that I uphold. And that, that's the free will. The free will is, is showing up consistently to make uh, slowly and gradually changes to your cognitive structure in whatever way you think it leads to a meaningful life. Well, Michael, I think that is a very uplifting way to end this conversation. Before we close, I just want to say thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. I'm sure that our listeners will enjoy this greatly. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, Great conversation. I'm happy to do it again anytime. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Paradigm Podcast. If you're enjoying this podcast, please consider sharing it with friends and family and leaving a five-star review on your favorite podcast player. This goes a long way towards boosting our visibility and helping us attract even more fantastic guests. You can also head on over to our website where you'll be able to submit questions for our guests, get access to special Ask Me Anything episodes and some other nice perks. The Paradigm Podcast is free, but donations are very much welcome. For more, check out the links in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me again next time.